So uh, last time that we saw was a very quick introduction to uh, quantum gases. So last time we finished uh, ideal, cla uh, ideal classical gases. So we derived uh, everything about the classical ideal gas. Uh, but from the distributions, from the classical limit of the Bose and Bose Einstein and Fermi Dirac distributions. So we uh, define a few things. So a quantum gas. Uh, is when all the quantum effects are important. That happens when the concentration of particles is close to the quantum concentration um, or larger. And that happens if your density is really high, but it can also happen if your temperature is really low. So when you have a quantum gas, then the behavior is going to be very different because for post Einstein, the distribution looks like that. For Fermi Dirac, it looks like this. And so over here in the classical limit, the behavior of both both Einstein and Fermi Dirac is the same and is very different from what happens at low temperatures for both the both Einstein and Fermi Dirac. So Fermi Dirac is going to be fermions and both Einstein is going to be bosons. So we're going to look at fermions first. And the other thing that we defined was uh, the meaning of a degenerate gas. So, you know, this would be like a pretty high, uh, pretty high temperature. At lower temperature, the Fermi Dirac looks more like this, or maybe a little bit like this. So, if the distribution is very close to how it looks like in its ground state, then it's called a, a degenerate um, gas or system. Okay, so let's take a look at Fermi gas. So imagine that we have, this could be like an atom or something like that. So we have the energy levels over here. Maybe they're separated by larger and larger um, energies. So this will be, let's just call it E. And uh, we can accommodate, if we had bosons, you know, all of them could just go to the ground state. But since there are fermions and you can only have one per quantum state, they will accommodate like this. So you will have a spin up electron and a spin down electron on each level. And each one of these, it's an orbital, right? So it has different quantum numbers. The energy of uh, these levels, you know, like over here, these two states have the same energy, uh, but they have different quantum numbers because this one is spin up, this one is spin down. So this one over here is gonna be, the Fermi energy. The Fermi energy is the energy of the most energetic fermion, electron or whatever you have in your system. So the energy of the highest occupy state. So this is going to happen at zero Kelvin. What do you think might happen 
at finite temperature. Some guesses. You guys can hear me, right? Okay, there's no one in class. Well, there's like eight people. So you have to step up because there's not that many people. What's gonna happen if you increase the temperature? Well, then one of these electrons might have enough energy to move to a higher energy state. So uh, if you want to draw the distribution, this will be the Fermi energy. In the ground state, it looks like this. If you increase the temperature a little bit, It's going to look like that, which means that maybe one of the uh, particles, fermions, that were close to the Fermi energy get enough energy to move above the Fermi energy. So it will be this one. The other important consequence of this arrangement of particles is that at zero Kelvin, so the system comes back to its ground state. Uh, these particles still have kinetic energy. If you had a boson, you know they will collapse to the ground to the lowest energy state. There's no kinetic energy over there, so for the zero point, point motion. Over here, each of these electrons has higher and higher energy, even though it is the ground state. It is the lowest energy state available to a system. They still have kinetic energy. So this kinetic energy is actually really high, as we will see in a little bit. So if the temperature of the system is much less than the Fermi energy, then the system is going to be very close to its ground state. It's going to be a degenerate gas. And we'll see that this Fermi energy is actually really high. And so almost every temperature is very low compared to the Fermi energy. And so almost every um, fermion gas is going to be in its degenerate ground state. Do you know examples of fermion gases? Metals is a good example. All right. So let's look at a uh, the ground state of a Fermi gas in three dimensions. The wave function of a particle in a box this one. So the good news is that we have we have already solved this problem. We did it in like chapter two or three, and I think three. So if these are the wave functions, what are the energies? The energies are h bar squared over two m.
pi over L squared and X squared plus N Y squared plus N Z squared. So uh, what picture is this painting? So if we, in the one dimensional case, you know, we have just a line, this will be N X. Uh, over here we will have zero. And this will look just like the ladder that we drew before. So each one of these will be a higher energy state. And so the, let's say N, well, this will be NX equals one, two, three, four, five, NX equals five. And so the, fermions, we just start to occupy the lowest energy states. And so they will just move up like that. How does this look in two dimensions? Well, we're going to have over here NX, and over here we're going to have NY. We're going to have something that looks like looks like this. And so, if you start adding fermions to the system, the first one is going to be over here because it's the lowest energy state and y equals nx equals one. Uh, the next one is gonna be, so I'm gonna put like, uh, say one, two, this one is also two, they have the same energy. This one will be the third one. And then, um, this will be four, four, five, five, six, and so on. So the electrons, the, the, the particles, will always try to minimize its energy. So how do they do that? By forming a, a circle, right? So in two dimensions, the Fermi um, what will this be? The Fermi line will be just like this, right? The electron, you, you will not have electrons over here because that's a higher energy state than you know, just bringing this one over here and just increasing the radius a little bit. So if you, pro you hopefully can see the progression here, how does it look in three dimensions? Any wild guesses? Are you guys awake? You have your three dimensions. You have an X. Um, y and N Z. You have your states over here. The electrons will try to go, or the fermions will try to go to the minimum um, state. And so they're going to form. This is like the shape of a circle. And then you know, it's difficult to draw a sphere over here. It's gonna look like that. 
it's going to be a sphere. Just like, you know, the Earth is mostly round because it minimizes the gravitational energy. That's what the electrons um, do also. Although this is in, in K space, node space. All right, so the electrons are going to feel that sphere. Uh, again, you still have like this, um, um, this grid, right? Three-dimensional grid inside of the sphere and each electron can occupy one of the, of the orbitals, one of the states. So the Fermi energy, put over here, is going to be in h bar squared over 2m over L squared. Just this is the, the radius of this sphere. So we can put that the Fermi radius squared. And so this is not the best notation, the NF. Um, because usually N means concentration, but the, the, uh, the radius of the sphere. All right. So this equation. So we can calculate a few more things about the system. We can calculate, for example, um, how many particles are going to be there for a given Fermi vector or Fermi radius? So the volume of the sphere is that. And we only look at the positives uh, and X and Y and Z. So these are going to multiply times one eighth, so just one octant. And this is a more realistic system. So we can put two particles per state, um, not per orbital, but you know, can put a spin up and spin down. Those are different orbitals. So per state, you can multiply it times two. And that is going to give us the number of particles. So I guess this one goes away with this one. And we have uh, that number of particles is pi over three and F cube, which implies that the Fermi radius is three uh, N over pi. to the one third. And that one is equation 7.6. So we will define because 
are not going to leave any state that is of lower energy and occupied. So they're going to form a perfect sphere. So if you know the number of particles, you know the, the radius of the Fermi sphere and vice versa. So then we can write the Fermi energy in terms of the number of particles and L. So this I'm just put it over here. Fermi energy h bar square over two m pi over l squared, and this is three n divided by pi to the two thirds. So we had before we had n f squared. Now we know n to that. So this is what we get. Um, that one we can separate it. So it's just h bar square over two m. We can put pi inside of the two thirds. That pi squared. So pi squared times three halves um, times three n l squared inside also. So l squared times three halves times pi to the two thirds. And so we have the two and two. That's an L cube volume uh, of a pi cube, and we have a pi down here. So we can just do pi squared, get rid of this one. And so this is, um, I guess I'm going to put it up right here 3 pi squared n divided by the volume. And n divided by the volume is the concentration. So don't get confused with the nf, which is the concentration n. Pretty cool, no? So we know the energy of the most energetic particle in these uh, degenerate Fermi gas. So this one is equation uh, 7.7. .7. All right. So we know the energy of the most um, energetic particle. So we can also get the energy of the ground state of the system. So that one is going to be, let's call it U naught. It's two because we have up and down. And then the sum over all the states n actually, well, this is nx and y and z. Um, Okay, this is an ugly notation because there's an n over here too. But this is so nx, ny, and z. Um, smaller than or equal to the Fermi vector. So again, we have our grid. We accommodate our particles, and we can sum 
over all the states that are occupied, we know exactly which ones are going to be occupied. It's going to be a sphere. And then this will be the, uh, will be, that will be uh, EN. So if we have many particles, the states are, the energy levels are going to be very close to each other. And so we can replace these by an integral as usual. So it's going to be um, yep. um, where do I have that? Here. This is going to be two times one eight, because we are considering only one quadrant. And this will be the radius, the certain radius will be from zero. Well, the radius will be from zero to the Fermi radius. We have the n, uh, n squared times uh, EF. And a four pi. So the four pi comes from uh, integrating over whole space, like we did before. Uh, we put this in spherical coordinates. We integrate over uh, phi, and that's where we get the n squared. Form. So it's the uh, the element for um, spherical coordinates. And then you know, times e, this is not just the energy of n. It goes up to the Fermi energy. All right. So, um, yeah, good. So let's solve this integral. So we have a two, one eight, and four pi. So these ones will go away. We end up with just the pi. So the ground state energy is gonna be pi integral from zero to NF, the N, N squared. And then we know what is the functional form of the, um, of the energies of the states. So it's gonna be H bar squared over two M uh, pi, and remember that mm, this is ugly notation. Mm. So I'm going to call this little n okay so this is to remind you that this is in the sphere 
So we're integrating over the radius. This is not the concentration. And it goes from all well, from zero to the Fermi radius, so the maximum energy. Um, okay, so um, we can take out the things that are constants, put them outside of the integral. So we have pi cubed over 2m h bar squared, uh, well, h bar over l squared integral from zero to the Fermi radius. And then this is um, equal to that. So this is an integral that we can solve easily. So the ground state energy is going to be pi cubed over 2m h bar over l squared n, um, well, yes, nf. Power divided by five. This is going to be evaluated from zero to the Fermi wave vector, I mean, uh, radius. And so now we can replace this um, underscore F with capital. So now this is the, the Fermi radius. Cool. So this five, let's put it over here. So we have the 10. And then this NF to the fifth power, say that it's NF squared times NF cubed. And we know what NF cubed is, because we just derived it. So, mm, let me see if I'm missing anything. Yeah, this is good. So, the NF cubed, it's equal to uh, 3 pi over N divided by pi to the 3 thirds. So you can get rid of this one. And so now this 3, we can put it over here. Uh, this pi, we can get rid of it because we have three of them up here. Okay. Um, yep. So now these uh, NF squared is going to be uh, 3N over pi to the two thirds. So we can play the same trick as before. So this one we can put it inside. I 
like that. And this L squared can put it inside like that. So this is going to be um, pi cubed. It's going to be L cubed. So we can get rid of this pi with one of the ones we have up here. And this is the volume. So this n divided by v is the concentration. Let's just call it n. This is not an f. Okay, that's just a regular concentration. And Mm. So we have, oh, this L is not there anymore. So we can put 2M over here. So take out the five. And uh, this n, I'm going to put it over here. So this one over here, uh, we derived it before. That is the uh, Fermi. Um, this for me energy. So that the ground state energy of the, the generate Fermi gas is of N EF. So that one is equation 7.9. This is a pretty neat result. So this is a gas. That means that the interactions between are um, where is this energy coming from? What kind of energy is it? It's kinetic energy. So you are confining the particles to some space, and they are fermions. They cannot occupy the same level, so they accommodate like this. So they have to move to higher and higher energies. So the uh, the Pauli exclusion principle forces the fermions to have kinetic energy. And this kinetic energy, you know, if you plug in numbers in there, it's really high. Okay, so this is a very insightful equation.
So the uh, Fermi energy depends on the concentration, which is number of particles divided by volume. So that would be Three fifths N H to M three pi squared N divided by the volume. If you plot the the uh, ground state energy, so this is at zero Kelvin, the ground state energy of the Fermi gas as a function of the volume, the ground state energy is proportional to one over V to the two thirds. Okay. So as you decrease the volume, the ground state energy increases. It's gonna look like that. The derivative minus derivative of the potential with respect to the displacement is a force. So what happens if you try to compress this system? The force increases more and more and more. The more you compress, the more difficult it is to continue compressing. If you want to compress it to zero volume, you're going to feel an infinite force. You cannot, you cannot put all the states in the same space. Nature precludes you from doing that. So, um, if you have um, a metal, let's say that this metal looks like a grid of ions which are positively charged. So the, the nuclei and a C of electrons. And the electrons are, are free. They're, they're like a free electron gas. Um, why do the electrons don't just fly away? if you have this force that is minimized by increasing its volume. Because you have an attractive Coulomb interaction. So this is going to be, um, let's call it, let's call it the Pauli exclusion principle. you're going to have um, another potential. So it will be the, the Coulomb potential, which is gonna go as one over R negative, right? Because it's attractive. So you're going to have another potential that looks like that. So 
So you're going to have you know, the addition of both. Uh, that is the potential that the electrons are going to feel. So when you add both of them, this is probably going to look like this. So there, there is a, a radius, let's call it, well, let's call it B, B naught, this is where in the volume part. There is a volume that minimizes the Pauli exclusion principle and the, uh, the Coulomb interaction. And this is the volume that things have, which I think is kind of really awesome. So the Coulomb interaction, it's a real force with real carriers, right? So the four fundamental forces, uh, gravity, electromagnetism, nuclear strong, nuclear weak. The Pauli exclusion principle is not a force because it doesn't have a force carrier. But since the potential increases, it is an effective force. So whatever you observe in nature is minimizing that those two potentials. And the other case that we're going to see in addition to metals is white dwarfs. So in white dwarfs, what is attracting the electrons is a gravitational force, which also, or a gravitational uh, potential, which also has this same interaction. So the physics uh, is the same. All right, so okay, cool. So let's look at the next thing. In like the first class, maybe it was the second class, we saw the definition of um, a weighted average. And we have been using that definition uh, as a thermal weighted average, well, to, to get thermal averages. So in general, this is gonna be the sum And this is over, you know, n x, n y, n z, and we're going to have the Fermi Dirac distribution, which is a function of the energy, temperature, and chemical potential, and the quantity of interest at that particular state. Um, but it is kind of cumbersome to take the average, thermal average like this, because um, we have to sum, you know, a lot of, you remember the 2D case. So, you know, we will need to know what happens here, what happens here, but whatever you're looking at energy or whatever, um, this state is equal to this one. So you have a degeneracy and this is, a, I guess the other kind of degeneracy, you have more than one state for a given energy level, uh, orbital, like if you're, we're actually talking about orbitals. Um, but this function 
we were going to be looking at is commonly known as the density of states. Okay, so if we want to compute the thermal average as a function of the energy instead of as a function of the, uh, the orbital n, we need a, an uh, auxiliary function. Right, so we're going to call it density. states, and we're going to represent it as um, script B. So then the rule that we want to, we're going to come up with says that we want to convert from this sum of things over here. Uh, we want to do this as an integral in the uh, in energy. And then we're going to have that auxiliary function. And then we're going to have you know, the quantity of interest. So if we want this to be true, how does the density of state states uh, should look like for the free uh, for the ideal Fermi gas? Well, we're going to look at that. So if we have this rule, then we can write that you know the thermal average of um, arbitrary quantity as the integral of the E density of states uh, for me for me direct distribution and quantity uh, of interest which now is a function of the energy. So that one is equation 7.2. All right. So we just saw I guess I can leave, them, leave that one down there. For the ideal degenerate Fermi gas in three dimensions, the energies are h bar over 2m three pi squared n over v to the two thirds. So this implies that the energy to the three halves m over h squared to the three halves volume three pi squared is equal to n. So we just solve for n from uh, the energy equation. So then if we take the uh, natural log on both sides, we get natural log of n is equal to the natural log of e to the 3 halves. So 
also the natural log of everything else. Okay, so if we consider a fixed volume, then this stuff over here is a constant. Natural log of a constant, it's a constant. And this one is going to be three halves natural log of E. So remember that at the, well, if we take the derivative on both sides, derivative over here. derivative over there, then uh, logarithmic uh, derivative is equal to one over n dn. And same thing over here for the energy, it's still a logarithmic derivative. And this is a derivative of a constant, so that's zero. Then we have the n over n equals three halves of the e over e. So this implies that the derivative of n respect to e is three halves of n, which is a function of the energy divided by the energy. All right, so uh, this is equation 7.17. And this, uh, the derivative of n with respect to E, it's what we call the density of state. And we're going to see why. So let's write this one kind of like this. We have uh, the n on this side, three halves of n of e over e dE. So instead of looking at the, the limit, let's consider a slightly larger range, so let's call this delta n, and this one we can call it delta e. So, you know, this delta is going to be e final minus e initial. So, if we plot The, the number of particles versus the energy. So f 
for the free for the Fermi gas, this function looks like this. The one half. It doesn't have to be, it can be anything. So if you look at you know the the electrons of the metal. Like that. Have your Fermi energy at some point. Okay. So this shape can be anything. It's arbitrary. And in fact, a lot of um, problems in physics are about finding this density of states. Um, this delta over here is going to be a range. And then we have the value as a function of the energy. So this is a square, right? This one over here. So it's that area. Right? So it tells you this area, the area under the curve tells you by how much the number of particles uh, have to increase. But notice that you can do this outside. You can do this above the Fermi energy. You can do it over here. So this N is actually not the number of particles, is something more generic is the number of states that are available to the particles. So this tells you how many states um, you have in here, or how many orbitals. So when you divide by delta E, that gives you the density of the states. And if you look at the limit, you know, as delta goes to zero, and so you go to the derivative case, then this becomes smaller and smaller. And so this ends up being, you know, just the, pretty much this number over here. So the number of states between E and E plus DE, right? So this is a distribution like the ones we have used uh, work with before. So, you know, this is a big thing in physics, especially if you're in on pretty much all of physics. So density of states right now, we're looking only at electrons, but we can have density of states of many other, in many other situations. And you know it works the same. Okay, so we have uh, this relationship over here, and we know what n as a function of the energy is for for a Fermi gas. Ideal for me. It is well, we have it up here. In two, three halves. 2m over h bar squared to the three halves p e over three pi squared. So we can get rid of one of the e's over here. We get one. So this is e to the one half. And Get rid of these three. This one, 
So if you want to rewrite this in a pretty way, put it over here. Yeah, over the derivative of the number of states with respect to the energy. Density of state. In the case of the ideal thermogats, V over two two pi squared. And so, as I mentioned, for the case of the ideal Fermi gas, the density of states is just, well, I guess it continues increasing, but slower and slower. Uh, it's proportional to e to the one half. And this is energy. This is number of states. Okay. So now we can express both the ground state energy, the kinetic energy, and the number of particles as the uh, thermal average. Um, in energy. So the number of particles is just an integral. from zero to infinity, DE, density of states, of Fermi Dirac distribution, and I like this one. So in the ground state, this Fermi Dirac distribution is going to be one and then zero, one below the Fermi energy and zero above the Fermi energy. So then this is equal to integral from zero to the Fermi energy of the E the states of E. For the ground state energy, going to have integral from zero to infinity of E. Remember that this is just the expectation value of the energy. Um, density of states of E, Fermi Dirac distribution. And we have the same thing. So this is the integral from zero, Fermi energy of the E 
e density of state, which is a function of e. So it's kind of cool. So, okay, this one is equation. So what happens when the Fermi Dirac distribution is not at zero Kelvin? Instead of looking like this, It's going to look like that. Uh, this is greatly exaggerated. This is like a pretty high temperature already. But you get the idea. So some of the states uh, up here, just below the Fermi energy, can move to states. They move to states just above the Fermi energy. So this integral over here, actually, this integral over here. We have the e to the one half behavior, and we're multiplying it times the Fermi Dirac distribution. So if the Fermi energy is over here at zero Kelvin, you have all of these states occupied and all of these states unoccupied. When you have a finite temperature, then uh, this is gonna look like this, well, like this. Okay, so, um, Yeah, like that. So you're going to have the same number of particles. Number of particles is conserved, but now some of them are gonna move to energies above Fermi energy. So it's gonna like spill over a little bit but you're going to leave some holes over here. Uh, so this is uh, figure 7.3. And it shows this spread T, which tells you, you know, kind of where it starts and where it ends. Uh, this function is going to be symmetric. So whatever you lose over here, you're going to gain over here. And how distorted it is from the zero Kelvin case depends on the temperature. So if the temperature is really high, you know, it was going to start over here and spill all the way over here. In most cases, the spill is going to be pretty tiny. And so it's just going to look like that. Okay, so awesome. So now that we have this quantity over here, the ground state energy, we can calculate, this is what we're gonna do next time. We can calculate the heat capacity. This heat capacity is the electronic heat capacity. Like every heat capacity is the change in the energy divided by the change 
in the temperature. So for um, an ideal monoatomic gas, this, Uh, this value. We have quite some petite and long limit. What do you expect the heat capacity to be? the electronic capacity, so the, the Fermi gas, compared to the classical gas. Is it going to be larger than or smaller than the classical one? There's three options. So you're going to be that wrong. Higher, lower, or equal. Come on. Oh, shoot. Okay. Um, it's much lower. Why? Uh, over here, all your, your atoms with every degree of freedom can carry energy. But in the case of the Fermi gas, The electrons cannot move the ones that are down here. They're trapped. So only the ones at the very top contribute to the heat capacity. And so the heat capacity is much smaller. All right, I'm going to stop recording here.